We are happy and delighted to see each and every person here this morning as we always are and we're glad to see so many beautiful faces in the audience and especially those that are visiting with us. We're happy and delighted to see you here this morning. If you are visiting with us, we want to make you feel at home and ask you to stick around and let us meet and greet you afterwards. But if you are visiting, we'd like to ask you to uh, fill out one of the visitor cards on the back of the pew in front of you and then pass it toward the inner aisle as the ushers will pick those up in just a couple of minutes. I have a stack of announcements here, so just bear with me for a little bit as I heard, well, there's Dawn, so it usually means I got a ton of announcements, so hang on just a minute. I uh, hope that you picked up a bulletin back there. Uh, there's plenty of information in there, but I'll quickly go through uh, some of the highlights. Uh, we want to continue to remember uh, Billy and Cecilia Gray as they are recovering, um, but also we want to continue to remember uh, Brother Tommy Rosenblum that many of you probably saw the message this week. He did have a heart attack. Um, he is in uh, Crestwood MICU at this point, but they're asking for no visitors at this point. Um, he is feeling a little bit better, but uh, the recovery will take a little bit of some time, so continue to remember him. We also want to continue to extend our sympathies to the Van Hooser family and their loss this past week, um, and the funeral services were on Friday. Uh, hopefully your secret pals, you are preparing to uh, participate in the event tonight after services. It'll be at the home of Betty Hall, and you're asked to bring finger foods, drinks, and desserts, and a $10 to $15 gift to exchange. And if you have any questions, you can see those listed there. And then also, uh, Ladies Not Out will be Thursday, December 7th at 6 p.m. at the home of Betty Hall. So uh, the party house is Betty Hall's house right now. So uh, make sure to see the list there also of all the announcements that are um, needed. Uh, the fruit basket list it is, is posted at this time. That's that time of the year. Um, it's on the uh, bulletin board by the secretary's office. Uh, the deadline is December the 13th, so please take a moment just to go on that list and make any additions, corrections, or changes that need to be made. And then also, if you sign up a name, uh, you are responsible for taking that basket, or if you'd like to take any of the other ones, uh, please make sure to uh, do that as well, too. Uh, we've got Community Day coming up next Saturday. Hopefully, you've looked at the list out there on the table of some opportunities that you can get involved in. Um, please make sure to sign up on that if you can help in any way, whether it be before or after or during. Um, we'll definitely need some help, probably like midday when we take the kids to Walmart next Saturday. So continue to uh, look at that list. Also, if you've got a name that you wanna put on the list to get one of the food boxes, those are out there as well too. Fill that out and bring that in. We'll need those by Wednesday. Um, but we'll continue to take those, but if you can get them in by Wednesday. Also, it was announced Wednesday night, but I'll reiterate it again, if you can help on this, uh, on this matter. Uh, we mentioned all of the items that we've been collecting over the time. All of them are done except the five pound bag of rice and the four pound bag of pinto beans. So if you can help find those items, um, that would be truly grateful uh, to bring those in. A couple other activities that are getting ready to come up. Breakfast, breakfast with Santa will be Saturday, December the 16th at 8.30. Uh, please bring breakfast foods to enjoy and also a wish list for Santa. And then the Ugly Sweater Christmas Party will be uh, the following day, the 17th at Seth and Jill's. And you're asked to bring drinks, desserts, and a $15 gift uh, for Dirty Christmas. Uh, anyone who has extra Walmart or grocery type plastic bags, uh, you're asked to please bring them tonight and leave them in the card room out there in the foyer. Um, we will need about 200 uh, for the winter homeless bags that they'll be giving away. And if you have any questions, uh, you can see Keela on that. Uh, Prime Timers, there's a note for you. You are planning on going to the Galaxy of Lights uh, December the 8th. Uh, they will leave at 5 p.m. They're asked to meet here at the church building uh, and they will take the van. And if you plan on going, please let Tim or Mary Gail know so that they can um, make sure to have a record that you're going to go and so that nobody is left behind at the, um, to go to that event. Uh, we wanna thank you for your participation in the uh, Child Haven and Agape for Christmas again this year. As you can see, there are tons of gifts out there. So uh, we appreciate that. Uh, if you have not brought your gifts, the deadline is tonight, uh, so please make sure you're, you bring those, and if you have any questions, you can see Patty. Also continue to remember uh, that they are taking donations for the Christmas dinner for Moa Loa. Uh, those are, that money is due by December the 15th, so if you'd like to help in that, and then also uh, the annual drive for the uh, school scholarship 
is also underway, and if you want to, that money is due uh, by January the 15th, so make note of those deadlines. Uh, we want to congratulate new great-grandparents this morning, and uh, if you haven't seen him yet, I know he's around here somewhere, he's beaming from ear to ear, but uh, Cecil and Jane Filiar are new great-grandparents. Uh, Alina Jewell was born Thursday night. She was born five weeks early, so she's only uh, four pounds at this point, but uh, things seem to be going well. Uh, so continue to remember that family as they will uh, be having some challenges over the next couple of weeks here. Uh, the opening song this morning will be 796. 796. Larry Hollingsworth will have our closing prayer, but as we begin service this morning, Presley Campbell will lead us in an opening prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this day, and we come to you in worship and thanksgiving. And Father, we thank you for blessing us with a place that is much more than most places in this world. You have given us many things physically, and we appreciate everything from all the food, all the clothing, all the shelter, and all the many freedoms that we enjoy here in a country that is more free than most any place in this world. Our Father, with this in mind, we pray that you will be with the government officials, our land, and the people that are serving in our military service. We ask that you will first give the people that are leading our country an insight into being more of a nation that is following you. We pray that all the people that are serving in our military service will be able to come home to their families, and we thank you for these people that are serving in places in our country and the world over, people that put their lives in danger for our security and our safety. We ask that you will bless the people that are serving in first responders and that you will enable their families to be able to continue to support them and be able to provide our safety. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you give us a good understanding of your word so that we may do your will as you would have us to be. Our Father, we thank you also for your plan for us in which the Christ came, gave his life, and suffered and died and was resurrected so that we may have life with you eternally. Our Father, we ask that you will be with each of us as we go to you and worship this day. We ask that you will help each of us to focus and direct our thoughts to what Christ has done for us and that what you have provided for us in this country that we live in. Our Father, we pray for the leadership of this congregation, that you will enable them to be able to make the decisions and lead this congregation in accordance to your will. Our Father, we ask that you will be with the people that have not been able to be with us. We pray for a special blessing for Billy and Cecilia Gray. We pray that you will Help those attending to them and themselves that they will be able to recover, be able to be better health in the future. And Father, we also pr give a special prayer for Tommy Rosenblum. We pray that he will be able to recover and be back to his normal walks of life. Father, we pray for the Van Hooser family that you will bless them in this time in which they have lost their loved ones and you will strengthen them and help them to be able to continue in their life in the coming weeks. Our Father, we enter into this worship we ask that you will bless each of us as we focus our attention to worship you and sing songs of praise and to remember what christ has done for us these things we do pray in christ's name amen Seven hundred ninety-six, seven ninety-six. do all three stanzas <clears throat> oh
Number 101, 101, we'll do the first and third stanzas, please. <clears throat> The everlasting portion more than friend or life to me all along I pilgrim journey Savior let be Number 90 this morning we'll sing before we partake of our Lord's Supper. This um, song talks about Christ that we adore. And uh, Jesus is our adoration today because of his great sacrifice that he gave for us at Calvary. The perfect life he lived and of course most of all his resurrection as we know. Without that nothing else would have mattered. But um, his great love for us, his intent to carry out his Father's will became apparent when he went through the, the very painful death at Calvary. So we're going to sing this before we partake of his emblems this morning as we keep him in mind. <clears throat> Christ with
Tell me, please. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for another first day of the week where we can gather together as, as Christians and at this time, Lord, remember the the sacrifice of your son and especially at this, this time, his body that was given for us and Lord, we're thankful for the willingness that he had to do that and sacrifice himself. And as we partake of this loaf, which represents that body, we ask that we do it in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father, to wash away our sins, we know it required the blood of a perfect sacrifice. Jesus fearfully and willingly provided that and asked for us to remember this morning. Help us direct our minds to that sacrifice and bless this cup. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Number 191, 191. We come to a time of our service to give back to God this morning monetarily as we have been prospered. And uh, we're reminded about God's care for us. Uh, he cares for all people, but he especially cares for his children. And those that are his, he takes special note of, of you and me and those of his family uh, on a continuous basis. And we see this in our lives. And the more we know that he cares for us, it ought to cause us to want to care for his cause and that is his kingdom to see this promoted the gospel teaching and shared with those that are in need we'll sing the first stanza of this before we give back this morning <clears throat> be not Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the day, for the many blessings of life that you really bless us with. Father, we're thankful for the abilities that you bless us with to earn a living for our families. Father, at this time, we pray as we give back to you. We do it in a cheerful manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to, please mark 667, 667, that'll be our song to encourage after the message this morning. And now number 527, 527, we'll do the first and the last stanzas. If you'd like to, please stand and we'll sing it together. <clears throat> the travel through life for this trouble and strife.
Good morning. It's good to see each of you out here this morning. Brother Don said he was greeting the pretty faces in the audience. I'm here to greet the rest of us. <clears throat> we are thankful for your presence. We hope that you are well in your life. We're thankful that you are here with us this morning. Sleep is a wonderful thing. I'm not necessarily encouraging you to do it right now, although some of you may be tempted. I, uh, I like the old story about the preacher who's had the guy on the front seat go to sleep on him, started snoring loudly, and he asked one of the other guys in the congregation to wake him up. And the man responded and said, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. Well, I hope we're not gonna put anybody to sleep this morning, but I wanna ask you the question, are we sleeping? And of course, I'm not thinking of that in literal at the moment. Sleep is a wonderful thing. You can just ask the parents of a two-week-old baby uh, how good sleep is because they're struggling. You can, you can tell by looking at the face of, of mom and dad after they've gotten a new one home from the hospital. Their eyes are tired. Their, their face is tired. They're, they're tired all over. They need sleep. You can just tell. If you do uh, any kind of research at all, you find out that sleep is a problem. 30 to 40 percent of Americans report that in any given year, they have some form of insomnia, an inability to sleep, either regularly, uh, an acute deal where it's uh, something that's come on them suddenly, um, or something else. And there are lots of reasons. Illness can uh, create a time where we don't sleep good. Our medications sometimes interfere with our normal sleep patterns. Uh, we can be having certain kind of experiences with our, our health in general. We can have hormonal issues or there may be uh, uh, other, there may be physical factors. You may sleep in a room with a snorer. Oh, you're not sleeping good if you got a snorer in the house. Uh, or there may be noises or, or light or sounds of some other sort or too hot or too cold or, or worry, psychological things, problems on our minds that we can't clear ourselves from. There are lots of problems that represent sleep. But if you've ever experienced a period of insomnia, you've gone through some situation where you couldn't sleep, weren't allowed to sleep, when you finally get the opportunity to sleep, uh, th that is a wonderful thing. You thank God for it. When you lay down in your bed and, and you can feel the, the, the curtain of sleepiness coming over you and you know that you're going to drift off, that, that can be a wonderful thing. Rest is a gift from God. When we start looking in the book of Genesis, one of the first, it is the first book of our Bible, one of the first things we run into is the creation of God. Creation. God is making the world and everything that goes with it. And our record in Genesis chapter 2 tells us as God finished creating everything in six days, that on the seventh day he rested from all of the creation of all of the things that he did. God rested. 
Now in scriptures, this is the first time we have a, a discussion of rest. God rested on the second or on the seventh day. Then that's going to become a pattern for everything that has to do with Israel. God is going to bring this in the form of a law. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 12. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. It wasn't just a pattern for their everyday work week. It, it, it established a pattern for life. Uh, God would tell them for six years you plant your crops in the field, but on the seventh year you allow the land to rest. You don't plow it. You don't plant it. You don't harvest it. You let whatever grows, grow. And the people of the land who don't own that property, the poor folks, they get to come in and uh, take advantage of that and use it. Uh, a couple of verses above that, verses 10 and 11, uh, describe that concept. The seventh year is the day of rest. And then, carrying that idea even farther, uh, God gets to the concept of the Jubilee, which uh, is going to come up um, in another discussion, Leviticus chapter 25, God gives the instruction regarding Jubilee. After you've had seven years or seven, uh, seven, seven year periods of, of work, the land is returned to its ownership. Slaves are released. There is a, a, a starting over period. So the concept of rest, God giving a break to the people, this is an idea of a blessing from God. This isn't a man-made thing. It's a gift from God. Psalm 127, verse 2, if you want to read with me, reads like this. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. And we skipped over the first verse. The psalmist is describing how much effort our world takes from us and what we put into it and whether or not we're doing any good. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. God provides for us. It may not be that you, you think about God giving rest but there are times when rest and sleep is the greatest gift in the world and if you've ever spent a period of time sleepless and you finally do get an opportunity to sleep and rest did you thank God for it I have on many occasions awakened from a day or from a night's rest and thanked God for the time of sleep. It's a true gift. Then we can drive back a little bit further to Psalm chapter 4. And we find ourselves now, David is writing and, and he's talking about his own experience with, with the Lord and resting. And if we just pick up a... Uh, piece of it and, and we don't get the whole there David says I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone O Lord make me dwell in safety all of Psalm chapter 4 hear me O God when I call O God my righteousness you have relieved me in my distress have mercy on me and hear my prayer and now David at the end says and I laid down not only did I lay down, but I slept. And I laid down and I slept because I knew God was watching over me safety, uh, safely. And I laid down and I slept, God watching over me safely. And I knew that that was God's gift to me. Maybe you've never been there. Even Jesus recognized Rest and sleep was a necessary part of life. 
Mark chapter 6, he drags his apostles, if that's the right word. They're engaged in the work of preaching the gospel and healing uh, diseases of all kinds. And so there are people always around them. And Mark 6 says that, that Jesus took the apostles. They were, they were there together. They were busy all the time. There was not so much enough time to eat or sleep. And he pulls them away for a period of rest. Even doing the work of God. There was a time to do something else. But I've got a question. Can sleep be a problem? If sleep is a gift of God, can there also be an issue? The photo that you're looking at is off of a webcast. And if you read the little pieces on it you'll find that it was from a station in Delaware and the caption says police say the driver fell asleep and in the background there is a truck and you can see the debris of uh, the vehicles that have been smashed into the guardrail and and uh, the damage that's there you can't see it all in in this shot um, some of the other pictures I had showed a little too much uh, debris and wreckage for me to include here but this one was just enough to give you the idea what happened you drive it along and a man driving the 18 wheeler apparently fell asleep while he was driving and started a chain reaction of other vehicles and a wreck that was serious the national highway transportation safety administration says that approximately 100,000 accidents a year are credited to sleeping or sleepy drivers. That they have either fallen asleep at the wheel or they are struggling with sleep. That they are, uh, they're drowsy. 15, or rather 1,500, I was going to say 15,000, 1,500 deaths every year are accounted to accidents caused by sleeping or sleepy drivers and over 40,000 injuries as a result of that. Some of you have probably ridden along at some point in time you were driving and you realized that you were not wide awake and you were you were sleepy, you were drowsy and, and you struggled with it. I don't know if you safely got through that experience or not I hope so but 30 to 40 percent of all accidents have some other factor other than physical things and many of them are attributed to sleep or a lack of it you probably can't see the background very good here but I'm going to describe it it's of the USS Fitzgerald earlier this year that ship ran into or was run into by another ship, a Japanese tanker. Seven crewmen died on this ship in the accident. The commander of the ship was removed from his duty. His first senior officer was removed from his duty. The first uh, in, uh, enlisted man was removed from his duty, all because they had failed to discharge properly the crew in taking care of the night watch. They had failures to maintain watch readiness, is the description. These people essentially had fallen asleep. They had fallen asleep at their job. They were not paying attention to what was going on, what was happening around them, and because of it, seven men, sailors, lost their lives. They were all asleep in their bunk, assuming that their shipmates were taking care of things properly. But they weren't. Fairly regularly, we'll have some report going on in the United States of a, of a train that derails or a wreck that happens that's uh, fairly prominent. And in the investigation, they'll find out that a conductor had fallen asleep or someone was literally asleep at the switch or at the wheel or something else. Sleep as a failure is a problem. Now, what happens when you're sleeping? When a person is asleep or sleeping, you are in a state where you are unaware of the dangerous surroundings. 
as we move through our world of transportation, we're rapidly driving down the highway at high speeds. And if you just take away your uh, eyes from the road for a minute, danger results. I don't know the circumstances of the accident that occurred out in our front yard. I'm not asking to know, don't want to know. But obviously a car got off the roadway at some point for some reason. And while it was off the roadway, clipped one of the, uh, the culverts, the, dr the driveway of the house in front of it, back up onto the road, now spewing oil and scratching onto the pavement, took out a telephone pole at the end of our property, went all the way across our property, and the vehicle ended up in the back of our neighbor's uh, backyard over here. What was going on in that car? Don't know whether that driver was sleeping or not, but something distracted them. Well, imagine what would happen if you're suddenly not paying attention to the road and your vehicle is now left essentially on autopilot. Well, terrible things are going to happen. It doesn't matter uh, what's going on. Th there could be fire. There can be uh, threats of people coming in. If you're asleep, you're not going to be aware of the dangerous surroundings. Number two, sleep is a failure because it impairs or removes a sense of judgment. You're not going to make any decisions while you're sleepy that are good. And if you are asleep, you're making none. They're out. Sleep is marked, number three, by a state of inaction. When you're asleep, you're not doing anything. When you're sleeping, you are at rest. You are not paying attention to the things going on around you or the people who are around you. And there are some well-known cases where that takes place. The story of Samson in the Old Testament tells us in Judges chapter 16 about his experience with a woman by the name of Delilah. Now, it's almost hard to read Judges chapter 16 because you want to go, what is wrong with you? You want to knock on Samson's head. Hey, buddy, are you a complete imbecile? He meets this woman, Delilah, who is a Philistine. She is a harlot, a prostitute, and he goes in and has an ongoing relationship with her over a period of time. The Philistines have come to Delilah, and Samson has been a terrible burden to them because he is so strong and has, has defied their armies, and they cannot vanquish him. So they enlist Delilah's help. They're going to pay her. Actually, there's some threat here, so uh, it's not entirely uh, the, the carrot being offered. But they say to Delilah, you find out the source of his strength, remove his strength, and we will pay you this money. And so she begins to try to find out. She tells Samson, tell me what your, what your strength is. And then he tells her, uh, and uh, after he falls asleep, she does whatever it is to him, and uh, then says, Samson, they're upon you, and he jumps up and, and beats the Philistines. Well, that happens over and over and over again. Finally, it says, after... Delilah wore upon Samson. He, she kept after him. He told her the truth. And he said, I have never had my hair shaved. And if my hair is cut, I will lose my strength. And Judges chapter 16 says that Delilah enticed Samson to sleep on her lap. And while he was sleeping, she had the hair cut off of his head. There's no way Samson would have allowed that to take place while he was awake. There is no strength that could have been used to take Samson's hair by force. But Samson was asleep among the dangers. Samson was asleep and had lost all sense of judgment. Samson was asleep and was now completely inactive. And he had his hair and his strength and eventually his life taken because of this event. I'm not sure we would describe it as a failure only of sleeping, but it's definitely a sleep which caused this problem. 
There's an interesting passage in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'd like for you to go with me and read there. In 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23, Paul talks about our partaking of the Lord's Supper. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, that's the teaching section. But then he gets to making the application. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the, blood, the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, what is it that they're doing wrong? They are not, they're not, they're not examining themselves. They're not thinking about who I am while they're taking the Lord's Supper. They're not remembering the Lord's death. They're not remembering the Lord's body, His blood, the sacrifice for it. A few minutes, a few minutes ago when we partook of the Lord's Supper, what was on your mind? This is an opportunity for us as Christians to gather together and spend some time examining ourselves. To look inside, to determine our actions, our course of, of direction, the things that we're doing, things that we're not doing, while we remember the body and the blood of the Lord and the sacrifice that He made for us, it's a time for us to look inside ourselves. But then Paul makes the last statement in verse 30 that I want to note. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. What did Paul say? Their failure to observe the Lord's Supper properly had created this outcome. They were weak, they were sick, and they were asleep. Why? What were they doing? They weren't using the Lord's Supper for what it was designed to be. There's one more passage that I want to take us to examine here for a moment. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm interested primarily in the sixth verse, but I want to start back in verse 4. First Thessalonians 5 verse 4. You, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are sons of light and sons of day. We're not of the night or of the darkness. Verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. The terminology that Paul uses here is there are two states of being. One is a sleepfulness, and the other is a wakefulness. And he says, we're not asleep. We know the Lord is coming. We know our life, how it should be lived. We are awake. We're watching. We're not going to be asleep. We are sons of day, not sons of night. Sons of night, that's darkness. That's the sleepy folks. We're of the day. We're of the awake folks. Paul says, this is how we're going to live our lives. And then Paul puts it in one more. And all of that summed up in Paul's statement in Romans chapter 13. Let's start reading in verse 11. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, let us put on the armor of light, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. What kind of description would you use for the person who is at night, who is not walking, who is walking improperly, who is involved in revelry and drunkenness and lewdness and lusting and strife and envy? Paul says they're asleep. 
their sleep. In fact, he uses several statements to describe them. First of all, he says to wake up. If you've ever traveled to a, uh, a destination where you had to sleep in a motel, sometimes they don't have clocks that work well. Sometimes they don't have clocks, clocks that have alarms on them. Sometimes you don't trust them. Sometimes you can't figure out how to get them set. And the easiest thing to do is to call the, the switchboard on the telephone and say, I need a wake-up call. That's right. You order a wake-up call from the front, and at the right time, the phone rings. You don't have to worry about it, and they will tell you it's time to get up, or either sometimes an electronic voice will do so. Why is it time to wake up? We all recognize that there's a certain point in which we can sleep no longer. I'm not going to ask you how many of you were woken up on the alarm clock this morning. I was. I would have continued sleeping. I was thankful for the rest I was getting, and had it not been for the alarm that kept going off, and I'm not going to tell you how many times I reset it. I stopped counting after about three or four. Hit the snooze button to give me just another minute or two, because I was sleepy. It's time to wake up. Paul says, why do we need to wake up? Because our date with God is closer every day. Wake up. I was talking with uh, some of our young folks this last week and over the holidays and one of our young ladies was describing her holidays and the tests that were coming up and the work that had to be done and turned in. And she was awake. She knew the deadline was looming. This wasn't a time to sleep. This is a time to stay awake. Well, are we aware of the deadlines that are coming? Are we aware? The, the, the night's gone. It's, it's time for us to be in the day. Put off these dark things. There's a reason for us to self-test. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and verse 2, well, in chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus describes the church at Sardis. And he says concerning the church at Sardis, as he does with others, I know your works. And then he says in verse 2, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. Can you imagine reading that with your name on it? You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Because of some of the high-profile attention that was given this last couple of weeks in, in college football. I've been paying a little more than normal attention to some of the things going along. And several coaches were let go from their posts. And if you had asked the folks who were involved, they might have said, these guys were asleep. They weren't getting the job done. They were not allowing the people to do the things that needed to be done. They were not forcing them to live up to their expectations. They're on the job, supposed to make sure that all of these things are working, and they're not making sure that they're working. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. So let's make that a little more personal. You have a bulletin? Turn on the back of the bulletin. And look at the names. Start in the left-hand corner. And what does the list look like? It says elders. There are three names there. There's no place to hide. When your name is in print, there's, there's no place to go. And it would be appropriate to ask those who are elders because they're responsible. Are you asleep or are you awake? The concept of sleep is I'm not paying attention. I, I have gone into inaction. I am not aware of the dangers that are around me. Sleep or awake? Is that an unfair question? No, it's a very fair question. You go down below that, who do you have? Got a list of deacons, about six guys, if I remember correctly. Would it be appropriate to ask each of one of those deacons and their work, are you asleep 
or are you awake? You have a responsibility to do. How are you discharging your responsibilities? Are you allowing things to go undone or are you in tune? Asleep or awake? You get past that section and you come to a smaller section. This one has ministers. Two names. Mine and Seth's. And would it be appropriate for us to be asked? You better believe it would. So Seth, are we awake or are we asleep? We've got a responsibility. We have young people, old people, others who we minister to. You see, as a congregation and members, you're on the list. As a member, where are you? Are you a sleeping member or are you a working member? You're one or the other. You can't work while you're asleep. You can't sleep while you're working. All of us fall into the category. Are we awake or are we asleep? Sleep's a good thing. We all need some sleep. But there are times when we can allow sleep to overcome us and we are not paying attention to where we need to be. And Paul says in Romans chapter 13, wake up. It's time to pay attention to the things of God. There are circumstances in all of our lives where we need a wake-up call. And I don't have any thought in my mind regarding our elders or deacons or Seth or myself that, that I would say I'm having uh, a quality or an issue that they're not living up to. It's just an awareness that we're responsible. All of us are responsible for the work of God. And we have a responsibility to execute those things that we have in our, our area. It's easy to get sleepy. And when you're sleepy, you are unconcerned about the outcome. It's time to wake up. You look outside the windows on this, what looks like March morning, and realize it's December. And we're coming to the conclusion of 2017 really fast. And I don't want to make this particularly morbid as we conclude our thoughts this morning, but I think it is important that we wake up because that's what Paul said to do, and wake up because our salvation is nearer than when we believed. I don't know what day you became a Christian, if you did. But the date that you're going to meet God is closer than it was last year, or last month, or last week, or yesterday. We're closer. How close? None of us knows how close. On a regular basis, I find myself in cemeteries for a variety of reasons. And from time to time, I'll take a, a chance to, to stroll through among the, the trees and the, the markers that are there. And on those markers, every single one of them has an ending date. It's got a year, and it's got a month, and it's got a day when their life came to an end. And every single one of us is going to have a month and a day and a year sooner or later attached to our name. And the question I want to ask you this morning is, wake up, because you don't know how far away from that date you are. None of us do. It is high time we woke up and stopped sleeping. It may be that you have slept your way through thinking that you're not a Christian or as a non-Christian, that you're going to somehow slip through this life and never stand before God. That's not going to happen. When Paul described in Acts chapter 17 as he preached to the people in Athens, he said, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And he has given us proof of that day 
and that he has raised Jesus from the dead. We're going to stand before God. We're going to give an account of our lives. And if we're not part of the family of God, our destiny will be to be separated from God for eternity. Don't sleep through life. The end is coming. And if you are a child of God, are you faithfully serving the Lord? Or have you allowed things to get undone that need to be done? Have you allowed things to become no longer of your concern that you know you ought to be concerned about? Maybe it's time for all of us to wake up. Are you sleeping? You need to wake up. If this morning we can assist you in a spiritual way in any way, perhaps you need to be baptized for the remission of sins today. Everything stands in readiness for you to do that. Perhaps you need to return to the Lord and make your life right. If we can assist you spiritually, come while we stand and sing. Appreciate that lesson. 789 will be our closing song. 789 will do the first and second stanzas. Services will be at 5 this evening again. If you'd like to join us, be here if you possibly can. And uh, again, if you're visiting with us, hope you can return then or come back at a future time. We appreciate you coming our way today if that's the case. And uh, let us know if we can reach out and serve you some way. <clears throat> Have our closing prayer after these two stanzas. Work for the night is
share your word with them. Father, we're thankful for the ability that you give us that we can use our hands and our minds to the living. Father, we pray as we part ways that you would forgive us of our sins and bring us back safe. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.